All right, let's get one thing straight. I am honored to be here. You're not honoring me. Thank you, Nick Lai. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you, everyone, for coming, particularly uh, the Clinton School for hosting me. And I have to wear these or I will not be able to see what I've written. It seems like every year on this day, people search for the right way to honor our nation's veterans. Um, some donate money, some volunteer, other visit memorials or museums that pay tribute to the heroism of those who have worn America's uniforms. Others listen to speeches. And it was on one of those Veterans Day speeches at Arlington National Cemetery that President Bill Clinton, whose legacy is honored by this great institution, once said, Today, hundreds of millions of people in the United States and around the world sleep in peace because more than a million Americans rest in peace, in graves marked and unmarked all across the world. Today, we come again to say that we owe them a debt that we can never repay. These words ring true, especially for the families of those who never returned, but millions of Americans who've had the good fortune of returning from the battlefield have found neither rest nor peace. Yes, many of us feel that we feel a profound sense of loss when our service is over. We, we signed up to something larger and greater than ourselves, and when it ends, we're often at loose ends. We want to do more. There's plenty to do. We have about 21 million living American veterans. Our World War II veterans are dying at a rate of about 680 a day. We're now commemorating the 60th anniversary of the Korean War, and Ken Burns is making a documentary about the Vietnam War. That started 50 years ago, so that group's moving along quite as well. As Kelly said, I run an organization that's, called, that's based on the idea that every veteran has a story, and we're focused on helping them tell their own stories. So today, I would like to propose a different way that we can help honor Americans, America's veterans' service. Seek out a veteran today, or tomorrow, and encourage them to tell you a story from their service. The simple act of telling a story may seem to be a mundane, everyday occurrence, but for a returning veteran, it can be something much more meaningful. It can be a way for veterans to continue their service by reporting back on what they've seen. Oliver Wendell Holmes, who served as an officer in the Union Infantry, spoke about this idea more than 100 years ago. He said, the generation that carried on the war has been set apart by its experience. Through our great good fortune, in our youth our hearts were touched with fire. It was given to us to learn at the outset that life is a profound and a passionate thing. It is for us to bear the report to those who come after us. Justice Holmes spoke to this idea of bearing witness, and I think that this is one of the two most important reasons for veterans to tell their own stories. Vera Britton, who was a nurse in World War I, addressed the other in her memoir, A Testament of Youth. Only, I felt, by some such attempt to write history in terms of personal life, could I rescue something that might be of value, some element of truth and hope and usefulness from the smashing up of my own youth by the war. Nurse Britton wanted to make sense of her experience, and she needed a tool to help her do that. Writing was her tool. It was and is mine also. I served in five war zones over a 10-year period. I was in Rwanda, Kosovo, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Darfur. I was treated for post-traumatic stress disorder in Afghanistan in 2003, but I continued to deploy to war zones over the three subsequent years until I was medically evacuated from Darfur during my second tour. I've written quite a bit about this, so I won't take up your time discussing it today, but suffice to say I was in a very bad place. I came close to taking my own life. When I came home, I had a number of things to try and make sense of, and I felt very strongly the need to bear witness to what I had seen in those five wars. So I began to write. I wrote essays mostly, trying to get onto the page what those wars felt like, what they looked like and smelled like. I wanted to let the people who sent us over there know what was happening. 
What happened to the people there? What happened to us? I needed very badly to make sense of what I had seen and taken part in, genocide and its aftermath in Rwanda and Darfur, ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity in Kosovo, sectarian and civil war in Iraq, and a war in Afghanistan too complex to sum up in just a few phrases. I wrote things down during the wars because it was my job, but also because I wanted to remember. I knew somehow that it would be important, this bearing witness. I knew that somewhere, sometime, someone would say, it didn't happen. Or no, it wasn't that way at all. We have public repositories of big lies and big crimes. We have museums and memorials, documentary films and academic studies, but we also need, I believe, individuals to retain the memories, to bear the report to those who come after, as Justice Holmes said. I was determined that I would be one of those people. I wanted to remember until I didn't. At some point, I realized I was no longer in control of those memories, that they were in control of me. Again, I won't go too far down this road, but one of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder is the recurrence of intrusive images, visual pictures in one's head that aren't under the individual's control. I was unable to control what appeared in my mind's eye, in dreams when I slept or even during the day. I thought I was going crazy. So I sought help, and in time, with medication and therapy, I'm now recovering. Writing helped me make sense of what Vera Britton called the smashing up of my own youth, although it's you can tell I wasn't so young in some of those wars. I took advantage of the post-9-11 post GI Bill to go back to graduate school. One night when I was driving home from class, things had gone very well, and I felt like I was really improving as a writer. And it struck me that I was using the taxpayer's dollar for this, and I wondered how I would make good on that. How would I pay it back, or forward, I'm never really sure how that works. How would I pay back what I was gaining? I thought about it for a few days, and the end result is the nonprofit I run today called the Veterans Writing Project. We're a nonprofit based in Washington. We provide no cost writing seminars and workshops for veterans, for service members, and for military family members. Our mission is pretty simple, really to give participants in our seminars the skills and confidence they need to tell their own stories. Our instructors have to meet three basic criteria working writer, graduate of an MA or MFA writing program, combat veteran. We approach our work in three ways, literary, social, and therapeutic. The oldest extant works of literature we have are war and return narratives, the Iliad, the Odyssey. Some of the greatest literary works have been created by veterans. You need only scan the list of Nobel laureates in literature to confirm this. Among them, Ernest Hemingway, William Faulkner, William Golding, Winston Churchill, Samuel Beckett, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Gunter Grass, and this year's most recent awardee laureate, Mo Young. The Second World War produced American giants like Joseph Heller, J.D. Salinger, Norman Mailer, William Styron, James Dickey. I believe there's a new wave of American literature coming and that much of it will be generated by veterans of these two wars and by their family members. But we also look at the social value of what we do. In the United States today, less than 1% of Americans serve in the military. This is unprecedented in a time of war. Admiral Mullen, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, spoke about this, saying of the civilian population, I fear they do not know us. I fear they do not comprehend the full weight of the burden we carry or the price we pay when we return from battle. We believe that by having members of the military community tell their stories and putting those stories in front of the broader population, we can help bridge this divide. And of course, there's a therapeutic aspect to the work we do. I spoke just a bit earlier about my personal experience, so I'll simply add here that all of our instructors also teach at the Defense Center of Excellence for Traumatic Brain Injury and Psychological Health, which is at uh, Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, and this is part of the National Endowment for the Arts program called Operation Homecoming. 
Okay, that, that's enough about our program. Let's think more broadly for just a few moments. Storytelling has a long history among the warrior class. When Greek warriors came home from Troy, villagers came out to hear them tell the stories of their battle. This was necessary, of course, because the Trojan War preceded Twitter by about 9,000 years, but more importantly, it was necessary for the warriors to tell their own stories. They needed to tell their stories in order to validate their sacrifice, to make some sense of what had happened to them, and to bear witness to the citizens who had sent them to war in the first place. And war narratives have forever illuminated war's chaos, its violence, the human suffering, as well as the humor, the irony, and the intense passions it can generate. When we create a literature of war, we set poetry, the belle lettre, literary nonfiction, alongside chemical weapons, intercontinental missiles with thermonuclear warheads, and robotic drones. And in doing so, we draw on a synthesis of imaginations used for vastly disparate ends. Our highest artistic aspirations are inextricably fused with our deadliest scientific creations. It's not surprising then that some veterans feel that war writing is just too difficult a subject. After all, how could one possibly address something on the scale of the Second World War? Six years of fighting on a global scale. Sixty million dead. The Holocaust. Hiroshima. How can we express this with mere words? The sense of impossibility isn't new. 2,900 years ago, Homer wrote, how can I picture it all? It would take a god to tell the tale. And some have said that in the wake of so much killing in the 20th century, and in particular the Holocaust, that to create poetry or other works of art is barbaric. Others will argue that creating works of literature of or about war glorifies it. It encourages the next generation to go to war rather than to do everything possible to stop it. President Clinton said, fulfilling our responsibility to lead for peace and freedom and to be faithful not only to our service personnel but to our veterans requires us to do more than prepare people to fight war and take care of them when they come home. We must work with greater determination to prevent wars. Every American who gave his or her life for our country was in one way or another a victim of peace that faltered, of diplomacy that failed. Maybe telling the truth about war and its consequences will help strengthen our desire to make peace through diplomacy. And again, words are not always sufficient to illuminate the war experience, but they are what we have. We have to make them work. We have to give substance to abstractions like glory, honor, valor, while we memorialize names like Shiloh, Bellow Wood, Normandy, Huey, and Fallujah. So since I'm asking you to approach the veterans you know, or even someone you don't, I should try and explain what will happen and what will it mean Many of us, when we're first back from war, will have a friend or a family member say something like, so what was it like? And when we try to tell them, it usually takes about 30 seconds until their eyes kind of glaze over. And they're thinking about the shopping list or the football game or something. They cannot relate. This is, of course, a problem in the telling, not in the hearing. Remember Homer's question, how can I tell it all? It would take a god. It's hard to tell war stories, so most people don't. Most veterans, when pressed, will talk about something funny that happened in their training or some ridiculous thing about the bureaucracy of the military. War stories about death and fear, violence and anger are very, very hard to tell. In fact, there are some things that we dare not tell. In 1918, the war poet Siegfried Sassoon wrote about this in a poem called Remorse. Here's just a small piece of that. Could anything be worse, he wonders, remembering how he saw those Germans run, screaming for mercy among the stumps of trees, green-faced they dodged and darted. There was one, livid with terror, clutching at his knees, 
Our chaps were sticking them like pigs. Oh, hell! He thought, there's things in war one dare not tell. Poor father sitting safe at home who reads of dying heroes and deathless deeds. Half a century later, American Tim O'Brien wrote about war stories in this little bit from his novel, The Things They Carried. In the end, of course, a true war story is never about war. It's about sunlight. It's about the special way that dawn spreads out on a river when you know that you must cross that river and march into the mountains and do things that you are afraid to do. It's about love and memory. It's about sorrow. It's about sisters who never write back and people who never listen. So let's all vow today not to be one of those people who don't listen. Let me try and bring this to some sort of a conclusion by coming back to the idea of service. The fact that you are here in a school of public service is testament to your willingness to serve something larger than yourselves. Service members and their families have made this commitment and they live it every day. For veterans, once that commitment ends, they, we, are often at a loss. Isolation, whether physical or emotional, is a significant issue for returning veterans. Imagine serving in a combat with a small group of men and women and then watching as that group dissolves back at home station. The loss of camaraderie, the lack of a sense of mission, the flat out boredom of life after combat can all be addressed, at least in part, by bearing witness. Encouraging veterans to tell their stories publicly gives them a mission. Doing so can allow some of us to remain an important part of the war effort while others may prefer expressing their views of the shortcomings of leadership or policy or the folly or immorality of war. In the end, warriors and patriots, departing military service, whether by choice or because of wounds or injuries, can be traumatic within itself. Remaining engaged or re-engaging can help lessen feelings of guilt or of abandonment that frequently arrive at the conclusion of one's military service. You can have a role in this. You can step forward and get these stories told. In doing so, you are taking part in something larger than yourself. You will be engaging in public service. And it may seem a small thing, but instead of just slapping a yellow magnet, yellow ribbon magnet on the back of your car, please take the time to ask the veterans in your life or someone you don't know, but who could probably use the company and the chance to talk to someone Ask them about their experience serving this great nation of ours. Stop by the VFW Hall or the old folks' home. Go to a public reading, a memorial ceremony, and take the extra step. Don't just say, thank you for your service. Ask them to tell you a story. My dad was a sailor, and he talked like one. I guess that's why I do too sometimes. Please bear with me for this. He told me once that all good war stories start off with a line like, now this is no shit. Or, and there we were. <laughs> so when you hear that, you'll know you're hearing a good war story. <clears throat> thank you for coming today, and thank you very much to the staff of the Clinton Center for inviting me, and the Clinton School of Public Service for inviting me. I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. If you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. Yes, ma'am. I came because my son-in-law is a veteran, and I want he likes to write. I want to give him this information. But I wondered if before that, I think there may be some people in the room that are veterans. Could we have them stand and give a hand to all those people? Sure. If they want. Are there any veterans in the room? Veterans? Well, stand up. is to walk up to somebody and say, tell us your story. Because uh, several of us have done that here and certainly I did in California. 
And um, I, I've never gotten a response like you're talking about. I think you've got, somebody's got to create a, a, an arena where it's stated that veterans will be talking, maybe a panel, and we could go and we would be, it, it would create a safety area for the men or the women and we could hear like we've heard you. There's not a person I've ever talked to who wouldn't give anything if we knew what to say or how to say it or how to ask it. I mean, I never see a soldier in an airport that I don't walk over and say thank you. But you're saying, don't just do that. But how, how do we find a veteran to talk to us? There's one sitting right across the table from you. There's another one sitting next to him. Um, there are probably people in your own family or friends down the street. Um, breaking the ice is incredibly hard. I mean, I'm one of those people that I, I walk through the mall and I stare at my feet, you know. Just the, the, the extrovert in me, if I feel extroverted at all, I'm going to stare at your shoes, you know, instead of mine. It's really hard. But when you're having a conversation with someone, if it's somebody you know, really just reach out and, you know, if you've got five minutes, if you got 10 minutes, say, where'd you serve? What did you do? Well, you know, don't say what was it like, because nobody knows how to answer that question. Well, where'd you serve? What did you do? Welcome home. So many from the generation that preceded mine from the Vietnam era. I was a, a couple of years too young to be drafted for Vietnam and um, was a, kind of an old guy when I went to Viet when I went to a, Afghanistan and Iraq, but that generation before me, they had a hard, much harder time when they came home. The World War II generation, a lot of them looked at them and said, ah, oh, you guys are losers. You lost, we won. Let's try and make that up to them. You know, the old folks home, the VFW hall, everywhere you can go, there's always a chance. Reach out, reach across the aisle. I know it's hard. I get, believe me, I get it. I'm terrified to stand in front of people and talk. I'm terrified to you know, talk to anybody, but it's worth it. And thanks for asking the question. You're halfway there. I think the phrase, and I want to ask you to tell a story where you start with, now this is no shit, is that the way you started? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one my dad starts with. Yeah. My dad was a uh, a battleship sailor in Korea, sending 16-inch uh, you know, uh, naval gunfire shells over, bombing the Chinese and North Koreans, and then at the end of his career, he was driving small boats in the Mekong Delta for the special operators. Um, my stories aren't really, really interesting. I will tell you that I spent um, a whole lot of time trying to understand what has happened to me and that writing is what has helped me make sense of it. Um, so many veterans struggle with things that they did in war. Because of the work that I was doing, I struggle a lot with the things I was unable to do, lives I was unable to save, wars I was unable to stop um, in Kosovo and in Darfur where we were sent to try and stop the war. And it's very, very difficult to stop a war when both sides are intent on killing each other. And the things that I worry about most at night are the lives of the people that I couldn't help. And that's no shit. I'll get off that phrase now, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm feeling just a little bit sad that your project won't allow teachers um, with MFAs that who don't have combat experience, because there are good teachers. I'm happy to address that. Oh, you are? Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Um, our current model is unsustainable. We are, at, we're currently at a place where it's fine because we teach once a semester. We teach a couple of extra times for the National Endowment for the Arts. We're mostly based in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, we have expanded into North Carolina, teaching at Fort Bragg. We're going up to New York to teach at um, St. John's College. I leave here tomorrow and go to Iowa to teach at Iowa Wesleyan College. We're now at the point where that model is not sustainable 
and anybody, once we get to the point where that's no longer sustainable, we're going to expand. And good teaching is good teaching. Anyone that can help us, we're going to be happy to take them on. Um, the original model, I developed it because I thought it would help us sort of break down walls, break down barriers. One of the things I found about is that once we get in the room, um, people are there because they want to learn. They've self-selected, and they're a lot less um, concerned about who's giving them, who's imparting the information. I, maybe I underestimated uh, the, the, the people that we were going to be teaching to even after been, being one of them for 25 years. Uh, so I, I understand this is unsustainable. When we get to the point where we need to, I have a long list of people that have said, I want to help, how can I help? And I'm going to start going to those people. If you're one of those people, shoot me an email. At uh, I, 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 I'm happy to talk to you offline, or I can. We are online at veteranswriting.org, one word, veteranswriting.org. And uh, our journal, which just came out, is called Odark30, and that's odark30.org, and you can read it online because we're trying to get it out as much as we can. And I'm Ron, it's Ron at veteranswriting.org, and please feel free to send me a note. Um, I understand it's unsustainable, and we're happy to break that once we get to the point that we need to. I like making people happy. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, Ron, thank you so much for thank coming. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thanks, man. Thank you.